thank you to Charmaine and Brian for these fantastic presentations. Thank you to, to Rosalie and Ginny for organizing and initiating this. So uh, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Jesse, the Cavalier, um, and together with Daniel, um, we are the kind of through line for this, uh, this series of, of presentations in terms of uh, dual, dual, dual moderation. Um, so I come, from, come to this from the point of view of architecture. My, my research is about um, logistics and uh, the built environment of logistics. And I, so, so I have lots of questions for you. But, um, but I want to start maybe with, um, with one more of a kind of observation and, and that leads to a question maybe for, for, for both of you about some of the things that you both um, uh, pointed to a little bit around the, um, the, the, this question of intermodality and the relationship to the parts that aren't the vessels. It strikes me that, that, um, that for all of the kind of work in um, carbon accounting that we're, it's actually a little bit outpaced by the kind of total management of the logistical mindset that sees the entire lifespan of something. So, so Charmaine, the chart you had that shows the kind of in, in, in intense entanglement of, of a single product. Uh, what made me, I, I was thinking about this as we were seeing all these images of containers that we, we talk about the vessel, but we don't necessarily talk about the cargo. And I think when we start thinking about this, that's so why I really appreciate that you were bringing up like the single thing, like the speaker, uh, brings this into a kind of concrete uh, level of understanding where the that thing is different than the the vessel, which is just one piece of its of its larger um, journey. So 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 then with something like slow steaming, where there would be a an, an impact on the the process of that, I guess I'm I'm curious about the ways that you might see the the. The, the kind of land side of this getting affected by uh, some of these transformations. And, and I guess for me, one of the things that, from my own point of view, that I find um, interesting but, but difficult with the question of logistical architecture is the their logistics as a kind of industry, as a body of work, as an area of knowledge, has a kind of tendency to abstract things, to make them manageable, and makes, those, makes that abstraction, uh, imposes that abstraction on the built environment. Uh, so, so that's sort of, I guess, the observation, and I'm curious as a way, as a question is more just like, could you talk more about those aspects of it, uh, and then we can come back to some more maybe specific or maybe more precise questions. Sure, thanks. Um, so maybe we can start by talking about uh, slow steaming and what that means for logistics. If you are going to move the same amount of material across the ocean, but you're going to suddenly slow down the entire fleet 20 to 30 percent, that suggests that you need to bring more ships um, into the mix in order to move that same amount of goods. Uh, this, this assumes that we want to keep uh, our demand steady or increasing, of course. And when you do that, there's a number of ships that are currently laid up that aren't actually operating just because of decreased demand. We're still recovering from the global economic downturn. But then also we need to build more ships as well if we're going to keep moving that same amount of goods. And so um, even when you account for bringing in these new ships and building new ships, slow steaming as a policy uh, still reduces emissions overall and so still helps as part of the uh, solution. Um, but then you're starting to create um, questions further along in the logistical supply chain and you've been talking about the just-in-time uh, supply chain. So are you going to move all goods uh, slower or are you just going to move certain goods slower? And uh, that's something that we've been working on at the IMO and trying to figure out if there are certain goods that are would be exempt from such a policy like uh, fresh uh, produce and fresh fish, for instance. Uh, currently, when you're coming into a port, there's a number of ships that are going to sit at anchor waiting for their turn to get into the port. So as far as the logistics go, if you slow down the, the fleet, you may actually have more time to figure out who's in the queue and communicate better when you're getting into port. And you could potentially improve efficiency at the port and the, and the turn times of the ships themselves. You only have so many bursts at the port, and you may have a number of ships that are still sitting there waiting that are just burning their smaller auxiliary engines waiting to come into port. And so we're starting to think about this from a systems point of view rather than just on the individual ship point of view. And of course, with, uh, with ships going slower, 
Um, maybe there's opportunities for improving supply chain logistics um, and something that we're starting to think more carefully about. Yeah, that was a fantastic answer. I, I think the only thing I would add is that likely what's going to happen, so ships take currently across the Pacific Ocean about 16 to 17 days. And so, you know, what 20 to 30 percent of a slowdown would mean would be an additional two to three, not hugely significant. Um, but I, I suspect that what would happen it would be just a recalibration of how warehouses stock their goods, right? So the way that just in time logistics works in warehouses now is that um, Amazon, for example, patterns how your goods are picked according to the demand that's forecasted, right? So if you bought um, a book on uh, architecture, you would have forecasted uh, several kinds of other books that you might have. And so the, the calibration of that doesn't actually take a long time to change. It th I think it is a matter of political will. And likely what would happen is we would have larger warehouses that would be sort of better able to um, hold stock. Um, but how just-in-time logistics currently works is that it, 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 it relies on the optimized system as we have it. Um, I don't actually think it takes that much to change how it's calculated. So I'd be curious if anyone's working on that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, look, we're so efficient, we don't even need two microphones. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> because slash the carbon footprint of these panels by like 1%. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm Daniel, and I'm obsessed with carbon footprinting. That's one of my themes. Um, so, you know, I, one number that has, has really stuck with me, so Stockholm Environmental Institute did a study, and they found, okay, for the average good that you purchase, just anything, like at all, um, the portion of the, and, and if you do the carbon footprint of that good, which includes the entire life cycle, of the good. So everything that it took to mine the products or extract the products, power the factories, make the thing, and then send it to you. 9% of the average product's uh, carbon footprint comes from pre-purchase transportation. So that's actually a pretty small amount. Um, and the reason is that shipping is extremely efficient, actually, like compared to all the other options. But that tells us like something interesting, which I think both of you were hinting at, uh, and which Alice was talking about uh, as well, which is that um, Shipping is carbon intensive, not because just the boats are carbon intensive, but because they facilitate the circulation of goods and things. So it's actually the thing that makes the world carbon intensive is not moving things by boat. That's almost trivial. It's the fact that we produce and then consume so much. And what the boats do is like make that possible. So, you know, I, I guess one of the, and, and by the, and this two day shipping though actually makes that worse. I think there's, there's studies show that because of two day shipping, trucks are often traveling half empty, ships are not as, as, as full as they would be. Um, so actually, if it was like five-day shipping, you know, it would be better. But, but whatever. The point being that, um, you know, so the question then is like, d does anybody in the IMO, which I love that, you know, so I can, you know, anyway, okay, whatever, we got it. Anyway, is anybody in the IMO talking about the possibility that demand for goods is going down? Like, is that ever being discussed? I mean, it's interesting to think what what is ever thought possible in these numbers of forecasts of emissions going ahead. And so it seems like the forecast of continued shipping growth is really the forecast of essentially the growth of the middle classes um, in, you know, uh, countries mostly in Asia, and then it also implies the continuing consumption of, you know, people in North America, South America, whatever, and so on. So, I mean, I'm curious if, if when you guys look around at this stuff, how much, how much is there a kind of fake analytic separation between the goods, as Jesse was talking about, and then the transportation, and how much can perspectives, maybe like your critical political economy perspective, try to integrate more holistically production, consumption, and transportation. Sorry, that's kind of a crazy meta question. Um, you can tell I live in the seminar room. <laughs> yeah, you guys are good at meta questions. Um, I don't have a full answer because I'm also good at meta questions, not so good at meta answers. Um, I, would say, I would say that um, one of the one of the things that surprises me is how much the forecasting on shipping isn't just about the IMO, it's also about shipping liners forecasting future trade growth, right? So shipping liners have been ordering mega ships on the basis of an expected uh, total global trade growth of 2.3, 2 to 3% a year. And so they've been building these extra large container ships on the expectation that demand will continue to match with supply and that 
therefore the container fleet capacity has to increase. It's not actually in response to, so, so there's an, in a way a speculative bet on the continued future demand and continued future um, desire of consumption of the, of the general public, right? And that's not in fact, I think what's happening. And, and in, in fact, what happens is that these shipping liners shoot themselves in the foot. So one thing that has happened with the sort of purchase of um, a huge number of mega ships in the past is that they have had completely empty container ships often and then an idled ship fleet of tons and tons of container, well not tons, but, but many container ships sort of idling off of the coast of X amount of ports waiting to be put into use, right? And what has happened with this is that um, just last year in 20, actually in 2016, Hanjin Shipping, the seventh largest company in the world, completely um, reached a bankruptcy they were $4 billion in debt and had to shut down. And if you remember this from the papers, there were stranded sailors for months and months at a time. Um, but I think what I'm trying to illustrate is that very often the kind of microeconomic decisions about shipping liners trying to forecast demand end up shooting each other in the foot in terms of the way that they're generating this, um, you know, high amount of supply that actually doesn't match demand. And What's interesting about that, I think, is that it's an effort to reduce slot costs and an effort to um, be more carbon efficient, and it ends up actually producing these kinds of unintended consequences. Yeah, and, and you asked if IMO even considers the possibility of decreased demand, and um, the answer to that is no. It, one of the arguments for having something in the initial greenhouse gas strategy, having the ambition be not even including an absolute emissions reduction target, was the shipping sector is beholden to global demand. It's not our fault if people want to consume more goods. We need to meet demand. We need to transport goods across the ocean. And it's not our fault. So you can't make us commit to reducing our emissions by 50% by 2050 or more um, because it's not fair to us. Um, there were a couple of holdouts that um, still held that line. Uh, but in the end, we did come up to this ag agreement with um, a fairly ambitious target to reduce emissions. Um, but uh, like Charmaine was saying, the ships are continuing to get bigger. There was a huge pre-order of ships before the global economic downturn that ended up still being built and still being put into service. And so, um, like you were saying, Daniel, that ships are very efficient. Um, but if we start having container ships continue to operate half full, they're half as efficient as they possibly could be. Maybe I, just as a, a follow-up question around some of these things, I mean, it, it strikes me that there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of challenge in the accounting model for these things because the, the way, like for the tilapia example is really an astonishing one, that um, in order to sell tilapia at a price that is sort of meeting demand so-called, that it goes through this like astonishingly wasteful process. And so I guess I'm curious if in your sort of travels through these worlds you've encountered uh, efforts to try to make these things more available, like basically a different way of explaining what's happening uh, in the way that now like, you know, the, with the, like the, the, the nutrition labels, for example, that describe calories in a, in a, in a chocolate bar or something is different than maybe was what happened before. So I'm curious if, if and I guess that part of that is leading to a, a larger discussion I hope we could have about the forgotten space that you were pointing to, Charmaine, and, and the, the challenges of basically cultivating an awareness of what's happening. I mean, I think in Alice Larkin's presentation, she also talks about the difficulty, like shipping versus aviation, where shipping is something that we largely uh, rely on but rarely think about. And so I guess I'm curious, the larger question would be like, a, you know, ways, thoughts you have about how that might become more available in the public, let's say. Um, we've started to think about this at the ICCT, but not for shipping. Um, we've started to do this for aviation, and we're working on a project where uh, when you go to purchase your plane ticket, you figure out how much carbon you're going to be spending, and then you can compare which flight you might take and if there's a layover and things like that. Uh, that's something where there's a con direct consumer purchasing the service for themselves and is, has a lot of agency in that process. Whereas if you're going to Amazon, for instance, and buying something and it's 50 cents cheaper for the same thing, maybe you just go with that. And so um, from our um, organization's point of view, um, we think it's very important, um, something that the um, 
those that fund us have not uh, been clamoring for at the moment, but I think it is uh, something that really ought to be considered and pursued. I'm totally not gonna answer your question because I think that actually awareness is a sleight of hand that makes us think that as long as we create an awareness around the problem, that there's somehow gonna be political action that follows. And so actually what I wanna suggest is that awareness might be one thing, right? Like a, a label on a consumer product that tells you how many carbon, how many, you know, X amount of carbon you emitted. That might be helpful, but that doesn't necessarily change patterns, right? And in fact, I think we learned that green capitalism is very good at making us feel good about consuming things and being better at it. And I think what we don't have a critique of is the entire systemic scale at which this stuff is happening. And that's why I think I really want to shift the, the conversation to what it means to think about its uneffect, uneven effects on vulnerable populations. Um, and there, I think what's critical and maybe what awareness is important in doing is actually thinking about the way that carbon emission reductions tend to be pretty market-based right now in ways that incentivize, let's say, public funding of private initiatives that end up actually taking money away from much needed public funding and other kinds of sources um, towards and channeling them towards, um, you know, initiatives that don't necessarily do what they intend to do. And the Alameda Corridor is a precise example of this, it, that it was in fact marketed as a way to be more carbon efficient. So, so maybe the question of awareness actually needs to think about not just awareness on the individual question of consumption, right, what we buy as a, as a product, but, but the question of consumption on a, on, a, on a total global scale. Great, okay, so let me pick up on that. So we, you talked about political will and um, we talked about you know, democratic decision making. Historically, the main causes for the rise of democracy, at least in North Atlantic countries, or the labor movement, um, and some of the most important uh, aspects of the labor movement have been uh, dock workers, and then of course workers in industries like coal, but also essentially in logistical roles, with workers who are at choke points for the system of the circulation of goods and also of, of energy sources. Um, so I'm interested in this question of like, okay, number one, um, how, who is actually gonna pay for the development of these like beautiful kite-flown hydrogen-powered ships? Uh, and then two, like, are there m models of innovation that don't screw over the workers who've been building our democracy? So I think most of us have probably seen The Wire. We know that making Baltimore a more efficient port actually, you know, involves gentrification of these lands. Think of places like uh, in New York, you know, in Red Hook. I went for a very slow run there today. I, you know, celebrated my birthday last night. And so it was a very painful run, but therefore I experienced the friction of what the port used to be like very dramatically. But anyway, um, but so the question is like, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> Sounds like you also had a recent birthday. Okay, so um, is, like, is, there a, is, is there a vision of technological progress in shipping that is not at the same time a vision of automation that is throwing workers out of work? Or is there, or can we think of at the same time like a kind of frontline struggle, but that is also making it possible for us to like circulate goods and services? Yeah, I mean, they're not gonna like eliminate the circulation of goods. So I don't know, I mean, is the question of like community or worker agency connected to the question of technological progress, or are those essentially two totally separate conversations? And if they're separate, like that makes me worried. Well, do you wanna say something on who's gonna pay for our beautiful new boats? Yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can start. So <laughs> at, at the IMO, the, the question right now with the ambition that they've set for themselves um, as, an, as a sector and then the industry that's going to be needed to come, come to the plate here and actually develop zero emission ships is how do we build a fund uh, to research and develop these technologies? A lot of these technologies are just in their infancy. So there's a lot of talk and hype about hydrogen um, to be used as a fuel in fuel cells and also maybe using ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, but it, that comes with its own issues of being completely toxic. <laughs> so um, there are these things to work out. And I can tell you that the discussions are centered around how do we pay for it and not what what happens if we build a zero emission ship? Do we, and then is it gonna be autonomous? And so do we even need a crew? And do we just have three guys in Antwerp just, you know, steering the ship remotely using satellites? And, you know, these are conversations I'm sure that com companies are having internally, but at the at the larger international policy level, it's mostly who's paying for it and what's the time frame in which we're going to develop and deploy these technologies. The, um, is Antwerp a major shipping center? Oh, um, Antwerp is actually... Like they own the diamonds, they own the ships. <laughs> it's, like... uh, it's actually one of the places where they've developed a hydrogen-powered 
right. ferry, and it, it operates in that area, a small ferry, just for a couple, you know, maybe 100 people. Uh, the current proposal on the table is for industry to charge itself a fee for fossil fuel consumption. So every ton of fuel that they consume, and big container ships can um, consume 100 tons a day, they might charge themselves two bucks. It's not very much. But when you're consuming 300 million tons of fuel a year as an industry, it's $600 million, half a billion. That's, that's not too bad. So uh, it could pay my salary a, a number of times over, and I could help. Um, but what they're, they're focusing on is some sort of fuel levy that can be put into an R&D fund that would be administered not just by the industry but also by academics and by civil society and, and researchers. Um, and governments to try and figure out how best to spend that money. We'll see how that works, but uh, in general, the industry themselves are interested in something that's uh, funded by themselves and that has some sort of oversight that sort of happens, it's blessed by the IMO, but sort of happens one step removed, which I think could be helpful. Okay. Is, is the Army involved in this? I mean, historically, the Army is important to logistics, the military. The U.S. military is very aggressive in fund, you know, trying to find alternatives to gasoline, obviously in order to like manage operations uh, in sunny countries better. Are they involved in the shipping conversation? They, there's certainly um, – the Coast Guard is very interested, especially when we're talking about things like Arctic shipping and um, where we have uh, Russia taking a big step in, in growing their Arctic fleet, and we've got one heavy icebreaker that runs on heavy fuel oil. So um, thinking about ways to operate ships – more efficiently for a longer term, getting away from nuclear, which is Russia's answer at, at the moment. And um, so the Coast Guard and the Navy have their own reasons for developing advanced technologies, but from a national security point of view. Uh, but the answer to date has mostly been um, nuclear power and, and hasn't been anything that's too expensive because um, fueling a ship by hydrogen is you know, many times more expensive than uh, with heavy fuel oil, for instance. Um is there technological progress that doesn't screw over the workers? I would love to hope so, but currently I don't think so. Um, so, you know, one thing I'll say is that the problem with enforcement is the cost of complaints are considerable, right? So right now, um, sulfur fuel burns, it's 3.5% sulfur fuel that's being used with heavy fuel oil. And to get to the point where you use only distillate, which is 0.1% sulfur, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that costs $320 per ton. Uh, ships burn on average between 1 to 16 tons per hour. So times that by the 5,000 ships on the ocean. Um, it's actually a significant cost, right? Um, I'm largely speculating here, so I want to be careful. But there have also been a lot of R&D efforts to try to make ships um, unmanned and automated. Amazon, for example, has purchased an entire shipping fleet, and there are already unmanned ships going on the um, going on the water. And so one of the calculuses that comes into play is that the fuel costs are going to be so large that they actually outpace crewing costs. How do you solve that problem? You get rid of your crew, right? This is actually, in fact, what the container as a technology also did at the ports because it got rid of um, what used to take an army of workers, you know, time to do. And usually a literal army because of the entanglements of the military. Um, it now takes a single crane operator. But I want to say, you know, one thing that's important to think about is that the long history of the International Longshore and Warehousing Union um, on the West Coast and uh, the ILA here um, has actually been to precisely not reject technological progress, but to accept that technology, technological progress will happen while fighting for jobs uh, to be kept. So uh, the ILWU, when containerization was invented, did lose a good number, I think, to the tune of 4,000 jobs. But what they did was say, we're not going to reject the fact that containers are likely going to come on the scene, but what we are going to argue for is that you maintain the territorial just jurisdiction of the ILWU and make sure that we still have jobs. And so job creation in sort of different kinds of roles got generated. So I think that's one thing to, to keep in mind, right, that, that the workers, that the working class have a view of environmentalism that isn't antithetical to it. Um, but in fact, we have to think about ways to work with what uh, also allows jobs to be kept and protected. Maybe I could just extend that a little bit by, um, Charmaine, I think when you were talking about this, this shift from a kind of mitigation to a larger understanding of, of climate justice, and you mentioned that there are some organizations that you're 
you've been looking at and and trying to understand better. I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on what those are, since or some maybe an example of, of one that's doing some of that work. I'll just do one, because I would love to also talk to the audience soon. Um, so Communities for a Better Environment in LA is, a, is an organization that um, is fantastic and has been doing a lot of work with the cities that are most affected by the port, so San Pedro, Commerce Garden City, um, Wilmington. And, and those are the places where children have played on baseball fields and then died of cancer two years later. Um, so Communities for a ben Better Environment has sort of led initiatives that are, are led by communities living in those locations to change the land use patterns. Um, so changing, let's say, a, a mountain of pollu like pollution-ridden rubble into a, uh, into a garden or a community garden, um, thinking about ways in which communities can actually protest or refuse the way that a highway is built through their community, community and actually pushed it further out, um, out of like heavy dense communities into places that are more commercial so that the effects are a little pushed out. Um, and so there, I think that there are ways to think about climate justice that has a, a specific attention to the ways that uh, working class poor are actually um, providing the kinds of solutions that we have, right? And it's not enough. Pushing a highway out doesn't actually solve the problem. Um, but I think it, it has to take really seriously what it means to, 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 to prioritize those communities at the, at the front end. I think we, uh, we should turn it out to uh, the audience. I'm sure there's some, some questions. So uh, I think perhaps we, we take a few and then we can uh, get some responses from our panel. Any questions, please? Um, well, there's so many problems that have been raised by the panel. Um, it, it seems to me that on a kind of high level overview, the big problem is that the cost of carbon is an externality economically uh, that isn't paid for in the system of, of the purchase of, of, of goods. So I wanted to hear the panel uh, talk about ways to address that on a macro scale that would affect all aspects of the economy. And I'm thinking in particular of a properly priced carbon tax uh, that would also, it seems to me, solve the transnational problem of shipping because the cost is imposed within each country as an effect a consumption tax. And then the political problem of getting that to happen and the political question of how is the revenue that's generated by the carbon tax actually allocated uh, equitably. Oh, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can start. Yeah, it's certainly uh, an externality that is not internalized at any level at the moment. Uh, the the fuel levy is um, a carbon tax in in disguise that the interest or that the industry is considering, although at two dollars uh, a ton, that works out to sixty six cents for a ton of carbon, which is not very much. So um, that's not in itself enough to really um, make any changes in behavior, but it does provide a source of funding that if pushed in the right direction could make a difference. Um, when the IMO is considering how it's going to achieve its ambition to actually reduce its emissions by at least 50% in 2050, and, and also I should mention that the overall goal is to completely eliminate its emissions before the end of the century, whatever that means, as, as late as 2099, I suppose, but um, there, you know, people are, are, some are arguing that that means 2050 and, and others are arguing that means 2075. But in order to do that, there are some ideas from academics on the table of, you know, how do we figure out how to internalize those external costs by either charging more on the, the, the fossil fuels that ships are using or um, by some other by some other market-based measure, but there's some hesitance to really pursue that too aggressively because the most important thing for a lot of people that have been working on this issue in shipping is to make sure that we achieve emissions reductions in the sector and that we don't start to um, make it so that it starts being attractive to start buying offsets, which we are not 
um, so optimistic about them having a real impact on reducing emissions or offsetting emissions that are being uh, pumped into the air. I'm going to let Daniel answer this one. It's his expertise. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, okay, so that's a, an amazing question. Um, let's say most people, I think, who work in this area think eventually there will be a price on carbon, and sooner would be better. We could get into, like, the mechanics of it, and I have actually lots of opinions. But I would say if, let, maybe thinking of it from the perspective of architecture. Okay, so let's say you get a price on carbon. What that does is it puts pressure on consumption because more it will be more expensive to buy anything. So now, depending on how that price is organized, the impact of this reduced pressure on consumption can go in different ways. So one thing that's very interesting to me is there's a book that came out a few years ago called Consumptionomics. It was reviewed by the managing editor of the Financial Times, sorry, the executive editor of the Financial Times. Uh, and it was written by a Singaporean uh, sustainable development expert who'd been quite high up in the government in Singapore. And he has a very simple argument. He says, look, the w middle classes of North America and Europe and the upper classes consume so much it could doom the planet. And what's worse, Asian uh, you know, middle and upper middle classes are getting richer and richer, and they're going to consume a whole bunch more. And he says, okay, if we in Asia consume as much as they consume in the West, the planet is, is done. Fortunately, in Singapore, we've invented this beautiful technology called managed democracy. And if we deploy that, then we can keep a lid on consumption. Um, and this is the kind of thing that kind of scares me, is thinking, okay, um, uh, to some extent, architecture, it seems, and design is right now really thinking about how do we make uh, en you know, the energy economies more efficient, while other people are thinking about how do you manage the question of demand. And I wonder if maybe we could think about how architects and designers can create you know, built environments in which people can feel good and consume less to avoid the kind of like draconian tamp down on consumption that is sort of like the Davos world solution, that, as we can see kind of exemplified in this, right? The executive ed editor of the Financial Times is getting excited about the Singapore solution to consumption, then we know that that is like a, a kind of a shitty world to go to. So we've been talking about how to make shipping more efficient, but then sort of underneath that is like what can architects and designers contribute in a way to thinking about helping to design and organize in everyday life, whether it's about consumption, uh, energy, et cetera, in which it's possible to live well and consume less, and that that is like shared democratically. That's the kind of way I would try to frame the, the challenge for architects and designers. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop with the nuclear um, <laughs> energy situation, which is sort of like the N-word these days. But maybe if it was marketed in a different way and it really hit the consumer in the belly and said you're saving this amount by and saving the environment um, if you just um, accept that nuclear is a possibility. And also, there's, there are international waters, right? There's the Sea of China, and then you get out into the big blue. And so how would that be marketed between territorialism and the international scene if one were to go in that direction, do you think? Thank you. Take one other question. There's a question up front. I, I can just lend the mic very briefly. Thank you. Yeah. So my the, my question is is simply, I guess, how is this organized, and what is the point? Of, what does that mean for struggle? And what I mean by that is, so thinking about some of the examples you talked about, there's this immense coordination between shipping companies in deciding how many ships to build, manufacturers rejecting their demand, ports expanding. Right. I'm kind of curious. What are the formal relationships uh, or organizations and, and connections between these very, very different sectors, these public and, and different private industries? How are they financed differently? My impression is that shipping was was a, was a hotbed of financial investment at one point, and it's kind of cooled off, and ports are more public investment. And and, and thing about Ala, was it Alameda, the Alameda quarter? Yeah, so, so what does this mean for resistance and struggle in terms of – the thinking of these these relationships between the different companies as weak points or, or looking for weak points and particularly particularly in, in their need for being financed so um, can, do you mind if I just answer that question uh, so I think you can speak to the international watch stuff yeah okay cool um, so that's an excellent question and I think that I'm hesitant to provide an answer largely because I I don't think that I'm the person to deliver it, right? To, to answer that question, we have to look at movements that are actually doing this work. Um, and there are plenty of examples of this. 
Um, you know, some of them have been really thinking about what it means to, to seize and recognize where the choke points in the distribution system is. And so one of them is that Amazon warehouse workers are now starting to organize and to really think about the, the choke points that are in Louisville and Seattle, really, that combine uh, a conversation with Seattle tech workers, uh, Seattle distribution warehouse workers, and to think about the ways in which their, their work, organizing together can actually create something quite significant in terms of a, of, of a labor organization. On, on the finance question, I think that's where things get really complicated and interesting, because the Alameda Corridor was a mixed-use, private-public uh, funded infrastructure, which, um, which actually was a pretty consequential uh, policy design in terms of the, the way that they argued that this would be consequential to not just LA, but the future of the world by facilitating global circulation. And so policy, um, basically political and economic elites work together to create a number of mechanisms to bring in both public and private funding. Bill Clinton gave it, I think, something like $700 million, um, and a lot of it was funded uh, you know, financially. So I think one challenge would actually be to pay attention to the nodes in which these kinds of mixed use funding come in and to think about how to map those so that we're aware of where to place pressure, right? So if pressure was placed, for example, on local LA government, that would not necessarily have been enough to think about the ways that private companies were coming in. Um, but, but again, yeah, I would love to talk about this more at length, but yeah, I, I think that there are movements who are doing this work and happy to give some suggestions later. Uh, on the issue of nuclear powered ships, I don't know if I completely understood the question. Is it that why aren't we pursuing nuclear powered ships? Yep. So um, Russia certainly doesn't seem to have an issue with it, and it's a really great way to get to the North Pole and then hang out there until the ice thaws enough and while still keeping everybody warm. Um, but when you start thinking about transporting uh, goods across the ocean using nuclear power for ships, in conversations I've had with um, those that represent ship owners and ship operators, they don't necessarily, uh, I mean, there's concerns about nuclear power and, and safety and what do you do with the waste and things like that. But as far as an emissions strategy, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it as far as getting to zero emissions. But there's a number of other concerns um, beyond crew safety and beyond um, beyond disposal of the spent waste, uh, including maybe most importantly, the issue of port state control, which is where the, when you want to come into a port, you need to comply with the regulations of the port that you're coming into. And that can be an environmental regulation or, or otherwise. And there are unlikely to be a number of major ports, um, which form the primary node points for international trade that would allow a ship to be um, a floating nuclear reactor coming into their port and endangering their people. So I think if that were to become an option, the classification societies that are responsible for certifying that a ship is safe would have a lot more work on their hands and there would be a pretty high bar uh, in order to achieve that when I think the conversation now is really focused on how do we get to zero emission fuels that are um, produced with renewable energy um, or some other some other way that avoids the nuclear question altogether. The, the really quick answer to the international waters question is that currently the legislation is such that you're held accountable to the state in which this ship is to which this ship is flagged. So there's no real way to police it in international waters. It's it's entirely dependent on where the ships are registered and who they're registered to. Yeah, so um, on the issue of reduced demand, there's um, – we tend to project the demand for shipping by the type of ship, and we're still predict predicting that container shipping demand will increase to fill sort of the excess capacity that's there in the market. Where there's not excess capacity at the moment is in the tanker industry. That's been pretty flat recently, and um, we're actually – we're projecting um, that oil tanker traffic will decrease over time, but only maybe by a couple of percent because these, these new fuels that are going to be used as the backbone for decarbonization will need to be transported from where they're produced to where they are going to be consumed. A, a lot of the fuels that you're going to be able to produce for low carbon or zero carbon are only going to be able to be produced where the 
source of energy is sufficiently clean. And then we, when you start thinking about where that energy actually is consumed, it still may require a number of ships to be transiting, uh, transiting the ocean. Um, so that's part of the answer, and, and maybe you have something to say as well. Um, yeah, just really quickly, I, I love this question. Um, so I think we've seen what happens with increased competition in lower rates, which is something like the Hanjin bankruptcy, where um, shipping companies unable to absorb that reduced demand end up having a sort of massive loss. And since then, Hanjin ships have then been bought up by larger companies. So one sort of economic consideration is that there's uh, increasing consolidation in the industry with large companies being able to buy up the excess capacity and shoulder some of the burden. Um, and I think the other sort of factor that makes shipping particularly interesting is that many of these liners that are largely successful are also also have a double function as the state's merchant marine. And so they, are, they have a function as uh, the company that, for example, transports your military equipment. So Israel's Zim company, for example, uh, faced some backlash last year, uh, sorry, t three years ago. And what happened is it, that it sold off some of its assets to Singapore, uh, to a, a holdings company in Singapore, but kept most of it because Israel needs it to ship uh, bullets and machinery back and forth. Um, so that's one example. And there's lots of other examples of uh, countries continuing to keep ship fle fleets afloat and buying them out of bankruptcy because they rely on them for other kinds of purposes. Thank you so much for coming.